Father God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O Lord, who through Jesus Christ is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> Pardon me. Well, last week we began a new series from the Gospel of John. Uh, John is a historical account written so that his readers may encounter Jesus. Uh, John says as much at the end of his book, chapter 20, verse 30, he says this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John's expressed purpose, his stated desire, is that by engaging with his gospel, we might encounter Jesus, the promised saviour, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by encountering we may believe and have life in all its fullness. And as John explains there in that verse, the primary way he does that is by highlighting several signs. That is, acts of supernatural power that Jesus performed. But by deliberately using the word signs instead of, say, miracles or, or wonders, John is making sure that we don't get distracted by the acts themselves, as amazing as they are, but rather we understand what they point to, what they are a sign of. Now, I think it's fair to say that some signs are clearer than others. I mean, take these, for example. They're all road signs from the highway code. And I reckon most of us in this room, if not all of us, can work out what they mean. Yeah? Stop. Give way. No right turn. Well, there are other signs, though, that, well, perhaps might need a little more explanation, like these. Uh, it's in German, so you won't be able to read the text anyway, unless you're fluent in German. But as far as I can make out, the first one says, don't blow a cloud in someone's face. Second one is, don't empty your pockets, maybe. I'm not sure. Third one, don't play guitar. Or do. I don't know. Don't saw the chair in half. And the last one, although it looks like he's just kicking there, relaxing. Do you know what he looks like he's got football boots on or crampons or something. He's got very sharp shoes. Absolutely bizarre. What about this one? What or who is Bob? And why do we need to beware? Well, finally, this one's from Australia, so I apologise if anyone is rather sensitive about it. But can you explain what on earth that is about? I have no idea. I have no idea. Well, in our passage this morning, sorry, I will do that. In our passage this morning, Jesus performs the first of his miraculous signs, which, as it says in verse 11, manifested his glory. That, that word manifest means reveals, makes clear. In other words, this sign points to Jesus' glory. But when you stop and think about it, about what Jesus actually does here, it kind of makes you wonder how this points to his glory. I mean, yeah, it's pretty cool that Jesus turned water into wine and that it spared a poor bridegroom's brushes, blushes. But how is that significant? In fact, why is this the first sign that was recorded in John's gospel? Why did Jesus choose this particular way to reveal his glory? Why not a miraculous healing? Or an exciting exorcism? Or a nature-defying moment like calm in a storm or walking on water? How does what appears to be just a simple parlour trick prove that Jesus turned water into wine? Oh, no, not a chance. Not a chance. How is this all significant? And what actually does it say about Jesus that his first miracle was to turn water into wine? Well, clearly there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. So as we encounter, as we, sorry, as we consider the encounters that Jesus has with the people in this story, we're hopefully going to see the significance of how this first sign of Jesus truly points to both his identity and to his mission. 
and therefore why it manifests his glory. So let's pick up the story and firstly an encounter between Jesus and his mum beginning there in verse 1. Uh, look at your Bibles with me. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Uh, John begins this account by telling us that three days have passed since the calling of those first disciples we heard about last week. And Jesus, his mum, and these disciples are invited to a wedding. Now, in those days, weddings were a much bigger deal than they are even today. Uh, they were elaborate, extravagant community events that often lasted several days. Consequently, much food and drink was consumed, which inevitably caused considerable financial strain upon the bridegroom, whose responsibility it was to provide for all his guests. Unfortunately, at this particular wedding at Cana in Galilee, Social catastrophe befalls this hapless groom because whilst the party was still in full swing, the wine runs out. Now, it's not immediately clear why Mary brings this problem to Jesus' attention in verse 3. Perhaps they were close enough to the couple that maybe even Mary's concern stems from some catering responsibility rather than, rather than just being a bit of a busybody. But in any case... Jesus' reply to his mum's request is somewhat surprising. Look at verse 4. Woman, what does this have to do with me? Now, to our modern ears, this sounds a little bit offensive, doesn't it? To say the least. But addressing Mary as woman is not actually as rude as it first seems. Uh, in Jesus' day, it was actually a term of respect, not a patronising patriarchal sneer. It's closer to when our American cousins use the word mom or sir to respectfully address adults, which is why the NIV actually translates it as dear woman. That said, it's still obviously not as warm as saying mum. And even so, there's no getting around the second half of the statement. Because Jesus kind of defensively replies there, doesn't he? What does this have to do with me? Why should I get involved when, as he continues in verse 4, my hour has not yet come? Now, I've got to say, on first reading, that is a bit of an odd thing to say, isn't it? Yeah? My hour has not come. What do you mean? A more natural response would be something like, what does this have to do with me? After all, it's their problem, not mine. Or maybe... What's this got to do with me? Surely the best man could just bob down to the local co-op and sort something out. But no, Jesus says, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So what does he mean by this statement? Well, the hour that Jesus is referring to is going to be mentioned again and again throughout John's gospel. And what we'll come to learn is that Jesus uses it to mean the time when he would go to the cross. It is the hour of his death. That is his hour. So that's what he means here. But that only makes this reply even more confusing. I mean, think about it. His mother comes to him and says, son, the wine has run out. And Jesus basically answers, sorry, mum, it's not my time to die yet. Seems bizarre. Why make that connection? Why does Mary's concern over keeping a wedding party going make Jesus contemplate his own death? Well, I think it's fair to say there's absolutely loads in this. But primarily, John wants us to see that in his response, Jesus is revealing something about who he really is, about his true identity. Now, we have to go back <clears throat> to the Old Testament to understand this, because in the Old Testament, God uses several descriptors to explain his relationship with his people. Sometimes he calls himself their king, at other times, He's their creator, both of which are wonderfully, gloriously true. But the thing is, God doesn't want his people to just imagine their relationship with him simply like a, a king has with his citizens or that a creator has with his creations. No, God also wants his people to understand that he has a relationship of love with them, which is why, incredibly, at times in the Old Testament, God likens his people to a bride and himself as a bridegroom, as a loving husband. Uh, so, for example, it's the metaphor at the heart of both Hosea's prophecy 
and also Psalm 45, where in that psalm, a bride is beautifully dressed, ready to marry her king, who is the Lord who sits on the throne. Uh, perhaps even clearer, we have Isaiah chapter uh, 45. No, we don't. It's connected now, of course it does. No, oh, never mind. Yeah, you might have to do that. It says, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. Now I think it's important to see that these identifiers all work together. Incredibly, God is creator and king and bridegroom. He's not simply one and the other. Press it now. We're back in Cana in Galilee by contrasting this groom's wedding setback with his own hour. It's like Jesus is saying to his mother, yes, you are right. I am the bridegroom. I am the promised husband of Israel. In other words, I am God. It's just this is not my wedding. Now, this claim shouldn't be a massive surprise to anyone who's reading John's gospel. Because as John has already said in his opening verse, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John is building a case throughout his gospel that Jesus the Word is the Son of God, at chapter 20, verse 30 again. But of course, it's one thing to claim to be God, but another to be able to back that up. Which is why John wants us to understand and see Jesus' first public sign. Look at verse 6. <clears throat> now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. Do you see what he's doing there? Jesus is taking on the role of the bridegroom by keeping the party going, by miraculously providing an abundant supply of wine. I mean, it's hard converting from ancient to modern measures, but it's likely that those stone jars would have contained the equivalent to somewhat, somewhere between about 800 and 1,000 bottles of wine. Which, when you consider that in the hot climate of the ancient Near East, wine was almost always diluted, stretching it even further, just tells you this is an insanely extravagant quantity of wine. Far too much for this one wedding in Cana. But it's not just the quantity that's extravagant, but the quality. Look at the ensuing encounter between the master of the feast and the no doubt now bemused groom. Verse 9. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This response tells us that this, this wine was not the kind of cheap, plunk, you know, discounted stuff you can buy in the local co-op. No, it was the finest of wine. It's an ancient equivalent to a 1961 Chateau Neuf de Pape or a 1982 Chateau Le Toit. Contrary to popular opinion, both then and now, Jesus is not a killjoy. He knows how to throw a party. He knows how to live the good life, live life in all its fullness. But more than that, that this first miracle that John records involves wine is itself significant. It is symbolic. Because wine is used throughout the Old Testament as a picture of God's goodness and blessing to his people. It was a sign of the fullness of joy of life that only God can provide to his people. So, for example, Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. This wine, then, is a sign of, a pointer to, confirmation that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. He is God. He is the bridegroom, able to graciously bring the ab abundant goodness and blessing of God to his people. This sign points us to the reality that Jesus Christ is God. But that's not all it points to. 
You see, this whole episode not only reveals something of who Jesus is, but it also tells us something of his mission and purpose, which becomes clear, actually, in the second encounter Jesus has in the passage, the encounter between himself and the bridegroom. Now, admittedly, this is an implied encounter because there's no direct connection with the two in the narrative, but nevertheless, Jesus' actions at that wedding meant that their encounter had a profound and lasting effect on the life and future of this groom. I think it's easy for us modern Westerners to underestimate the predicament that this groom found himself in. I mean, sure, it would be bad form to run out of wine at your wedding, wouldn't it? And yet, of course, we get that he would consequently lose some face. But come on, it's not as if anyone's died, is it? Surely it's not the end of the world. Except we need to remember that this groom lived in an honour and shame-based culture. One where public perception and status were absolutely everything. One where friendships were forged through hospitality. Where relationships were gauged by who you ate and drank with. Therefore, in that culture, to run out of wine at a wedding, well, it was almost criminal. In fact, in those days, it wasn't uncommon for a bride's family to sue the groom if the bar ran dry at the reception. Think of it like this. On the most important day of his life, on the day that he would prove himself to his community and demonstrate his ability to support and sustain his new family unit, this groom had come up short. He'd failed in his obligations. And therefore, just like the inflatable student, he'd not only let himself down, but his bride, his family, and his whole community. There'd be no hiding from this, no coming back. It would haunt and follow him, effectively defining him for the rest of his days. Yet that's not what happened, is it? No, incredibly, because of that encounter with Jesus, instead of being remembered as the despicable groom whose party ran dry, this groom would forever be remembered as the host who provided the most, the one who had apparently saved the best till last. Think about it. Think about it. By, by graciously supplying that miraculous wine, Jesus not only spared this groom from shame, but he covered him with glory. And so this act itself is also a sign pointing to what Jesus had come to do, not just for this groom, but for all of his people. In fact, for anyone who would come to him, anyone who would believe in him and therefore put their trust in him. Because you remember, when first confronted with the problem, what did Jesus say? He said, my hour is not yet come. I don't think it's too fanciful to imagine Jesus sat there at this wedding in Cana, observing the happy couple, watching the celebrations, but in his head contemplating his own wedding day. You see, in John's other major work, the book of Revelation, right at the end of our Bibles, right at the end of that book, chapter 21 of Revelation, We get a glimpse of the future, the very end of history as we know it. And at that point, the new Jerusalem, that is the totality of all of God's people, everyone who John says has believed and trusted in Jesus, every man, woman and child from every tribe, tongue and nation, John sees them coming down from heaven, beautifully dressed as a bride is dressed for her husband. It's the fulfillment of Psalm 45. And John is told that this beautiful bride is the wife of the Lamb. In other words, she is no other than the bride of Jesus Christ, who, if you remember last week, was identified as the Lamb of God. See, the uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus is going to get married. Jesus is going to have a wedding day. And as John sees it in, in Revelation, that day will be the party of all parties. The joy of all joys, the wine will overflow as the grace and goodness and blessing of God abounds to everyone who is there and on and on for all eternity. John states, Revelation chapter 19, blessed are those who are at the wedding of the Lamb. But here's the thing, for that wedding to take place, well, Jesus' bride must first be prepared. She must be made ready, made right for her wedding day. 
like contemporary brides, she must be clothed in white, in fine, bright and pure linen, as John sees in Revelation. But the problem is that just like this groom at Cana in Galilee, God's people, you and me, we've come up short and failed in our obligations. We've not loved God with all our hearts. Instead, we've actively gone and chased other loves, other hopes, other dreams. And therefore, if we're perfectly honest, we're unworthy of wearing white. Rather, our clothes, like our hearts, are stained. We're burdened with sin and shame, just like that groom. But cometh the hour, cometh the man. And at that hour, his hour, Jesus Christ, the promised bridegroom, gave his all to deal with the problem. As a loving spouse by union, Jesus took our sin and shame from us upon himself and he paid for it, paid the cost for it with his life at the cross. Jesus loves us so much that he literally died for us. And the Bible tells us his sacrifice is sufficient, his death effective. He can remove all our sin and shame. His blood washes us whiter than white. So white, in fact, there's no longer any need for empty rituals like those that those stone jars in Cana paid testimony to. No, the stone cold religion that people used to follow could be repurposed to hold the blessing of God's wine. But here's the thing, Jesus just didn't die. He was also raised to new life. And as the one then who deserves all the glory and honour and praise, yet just as he shared our infirmities like a true and perfect husband, he also shares with us his honour and glory. With my body I honour you, all that I am I give to you, and all that I have I share with you within the love of God. That's what couples say in the contemporary wedding service, and that's exactly what Jesus, the true bridegroom, did for his bride. What he will do for anyone who would come to him what he'll do for anyone who would place their hope in him. Just like he did for this grooming cane, a Jesus can take our sin and shame and exchange it for his glory. That's why John records this first sign of Jesus. That's why this is the first one. It's because it shows us that Jesus is the promised bridegroom of the Old Testament. That he is the one who's come to live out the love of God to us. He, he's the one who's come to beautify us and redeem the ones he loves by removing our sin and shame. He has come to share his honour and glory forevermore. So as we finish this morning, there's a, just a number of ways that John would encourage us to respond to Jesus. Three ways that are demonstrated actually by those who encountered him that day in Cana. The first is simply this. Believe in him. Believe in him. That's what we see. That's the response of the disciples, isn't it? From those who witnessed everything that happened that day. I mean, they, of course, were fully aware of where that wine actually came from. And so they understood that this miracle was indeed a sign, a sign point to, a revelation of, a manifestation of Jesus' glory. And so, verse 11, they simply believed in him. John wants us to read this account and recognize that Jesus is the promised bridegroom see that he is the son of God able to rescue and redeem us see that he is able to abundantly bless us and clothe us with glory now, of course John doesn't necessarily expect that we'll be fully convinced after just one encounter which is why his book contains several more signs pointing to and proving who Jesus is and what he came to do so all I'd say is if you still have doubts well come back next time and hear more. But if we are convinced, if we see that these signs point clearly to our Lord and Saviour, well, believe in him. Secondly, though, to believe in him is to receive from him, just like that groom in Cana. I mean, I think it's mind-blowing, actually, when you think about it. Because what does this bride bridegroom actually do in the story? What does he do? Well, absolutely diddly squat, didn't he? He did nothing. Nothing. He contributed nothing. 
I mean, he wasn't even aware that Jesus had turned that water into wine. Imagine his face when the master of the feast said, check out this wine. He's like, what? Uh, uh. All he could do was receive from Jesus. Now imagine how ridiculous it would have been if that groom, when presented with that amazing wine, had simply turned around to the master of the feast and said, I don't care how good it is. I don't care where it's come from. It's not come from me. It's not my wine. It's not my work, so get rid of it. I don't want it. Can you imagine that? That would have been insane, wouldn't it? That would have been absolutely insane. Well, thankfully, this groom had the humility to receive from Jesus. Well, guys, the same is true for us today. We can't work at making ourselves right. We can't beautify ourselves, dress ourselves up, put makeup on. It's not going to work. There's nothing we can do. Nothing we can contribute. All we can do is receive. Receive from Jesus. Humbly receive the grace that Jesus offers. Receive the fullness of life and blessing that only Jesus can give us. That only Jesus wants to give us. Receive from him. But that said, thirdly and finally, to truly believe and to truly receive from Jesus, we must also finally do what he says. Do what he says. Do whatever he tells you. That's the wonderful response of Mary, isn't it, in verse 4. You know, especially wonderful as when you think about it, she could have responded oh so differently, couldn't she? Woman, my hour's not yet come. She could have responded with, I don't know, anger or resentment, disappointment, embarrassment. And perhaps some of that would have been justified. And yet, putting any hard feelings to one side, Mary responded with faith. I guess at this stage, more than anyone else present at that wedding, she knew who Jesus was. She knew who Jesus was. She believed that he was the Son of God. And so she was willing to receive from him. But even then, she knew that a response is still necessary. Do whatever he tells you, she wisely tells the servants well likewise we would all do well to take this command seriously today to believe in Jesus to receive from Jesus is to do what he says do what he says do what he says in his word means listening to his words it'll mean walking in his ways it'll mean following where he goes even if doing that seems inexplicable or incredible or undesirable or even culturally unacceptable no we must always do what he says and then what we'll find is in Cana and Galilee our Lord Jesus will do the rest let's pray Father God we thank you that uh, that John was inspired to record this first sign that Jesus performed, a sign pointing to Jesus' power, his authority, his identity as your son. Father, pray that by work of your spirit in our hearts, you would help us to believe then in Jesus, to receive from him, but also to do what he says. Father, give us the strength to obey, the courage to be distinct. And we ask that knowing that Jesus will one day take us all home to be with him. One day we'll be with him at the wedding feast of the Lamb. And so we look forward to that day, knowing that whatever sorrows or troubles we face right now that like the wine the best is yet to come Amen